vast trackless desert, roadless, almost unknown, unmapped. In September 1933, two American geologists waded ashore on the nearby coast to begin a search in this strange barren land. On the first morning, when I stuck my head out from under the tent, all I could see was sand as far as I see. Nothing but sand. There wasn't anything there. There wasn't even any uh, date palms. The ancient oasis of Hofuf in Saudi Arabia's eastern region. For thousands of years, the meeting place for trading caravans. 400 kilometers inland, Riyadh, the center of the Al Saud dynasty. The founder of this newly unified country, King Abdal Aziz, permission to search for oil in his kingdom. The concession to search negotiated by Sheikh Abdallah al Suleiman, the king's finance minister, granted exclusive rights to prospect for oil in the entire eastern region of Saudi Arabia. At a small compound on the seacoast at Jubail, headquarters of the American company, Saudi guides and interpreters prepare for one of Carney's and the awesome task of mapping and exploring an area twice the size of Texas. The giant quest was by a small group of geologists, the first to survey the terrain for the slightest sign of what might lie beneath, Bert Miller, and his partner in the center, Krug Henry. Years of observation, years of conflicting doubts and convictions, all meticulously recorded. At first, the geological search was done by camel. The geologists would pack their food supplies, tents, and they needed for two months. They would be accompanied by two of the emirs Khawiya and one guide, always one guide. They knew every inch of the ground around there. They knew the water holes, they knew the, where the geologists wanted to go. December 15, stopped at Dikaka patch on Sabka. Hummocky sand with many bushes and a dead palm. Mohammed says one can get water here digging. The patient and enormous job done with the simplest of geologists and surveyors tools. Just over the horizon, always the hope for the first sign to confirm the intuition, oil might be there. Stop for the night at Bedouin camp northeast of Ain and Tarfa. Plentiful water. Dawn. The sand is damp with dew. In a few hours, the heat will be unbearable. scavenging for cells in desert caves. Top of limestone dome sighted. Big sketching contours all morning. Had dates and coffee with Bedouins.
thousands of rock samples methodically collected, searching for the face of the Earth as it was millions of years ago. Taking fixes on the sun and the stars, day after day, they patiently map the unknown regions of eastern Saudi Arabia. savage heat, thoughts of shade, a cool breeze, dreams held in the daily breath of the mirage. Sweet water, as in the palm gardens of Katif. The king urged them to search for this precious liquid hardly believing there could be another more precious. of the stars, our Saudi guides continued to lead the way across the desert. Their cosmic sense of scale and distance, our constant help through the unmapped land. We expect to find, they touch and feel the rocks, even taste some of them. Each new piece of rock, part of a giant jigsaw puzzle. A piece found a thousand kilometers away, a missing link. The geology of an entire subcontinent reconstructed piece by piece. Later on, the geological search was carried on by means of car convoys. Usually, there will be three cars, one driven by an American and the other by Saudi drivers. Cars were invaluable in extending, mapping, and speeding the search. Well, sometimes. an exciting advance to go farther and faster into the desert. The plane was extremely important to have as a working tool because it was, they enabled us to look down on the, the uh, regions and figure out what the structure was. It was like looking down on a map. Hundreds of aerial photographs, each one a piece of the Saudi landscape. Month after month, through heat and dust, the crew kept the fragile plane flying. processing hundreds of aerial photographs under impossibly difficult desert conditions. But for years to come, the 
caravans still played a vital role in supplying field crews, carrying spare parts for cars, spare parts for the plane, vital to the progress of the momentous search. At first, supplies from Europe and America could only come by Dow from nearby Bahrain, laboriously hauled ashore at Jubail, were unloaded on the sandy beach at Al Froger. In those days, everything we did, there was, there was a reason for doing it, almost a necessity. My first job in Saudi Arabia was building a pier at Al Khobar, which was the uh, spot where we arrived just a few days before. A pier was necessary in order to bring cargo from the outside. Being a new there, I had my hands full handling somewhere around 80 or so craft. The pier was a rather simple thing. We had piled up two walls, which were about 15 feet apart, and then eventually filled in between the two walls as it grew out to sea. We uh, dug rock from the bottom of the sea by uh, the use of pearl divers and fishermen with their raft. Uh, these men would uh, go to the bottom of the sea, bring the rock in. So I was a pretty busy fellow there for my first job. But uh, we got along rather well, and that was the beginning. The pier, another step forward in the search. Regular supplies by Dow. Even prefab housing and drilling equipment. As at last, they decided to drill down and see what was there. The site selected for the first test well by the geologist was some disk from our tent camp. So it uh, seemed to be uh, expedient to move our camp closer to the well site. Two other men and myself went up to the Jebel to select such a site. I don't know that there was any magic about it. It was nothing romantic or not uh, one of those memorable days. It was just going to be an old rocky place to put our bunks. Having the site, it was necessary to uh, have a name for it. So we consulted the Bedouin who were moving in that area and they called it Jebel Dahran. So this became the name of the campsite even to this day. The first rig appears on the chosen site, the geological structure known as the Damam Dome. From well number one, the first sign of oil soon dribbled out over the sand, but it was not enough. For the young Saudi crew, Working on well number one was a strange new experience, learning new skills and adapting their ancients. But for their American colleagues, the first meager droplets of oil created only hope and anxiety. We'd been taken in by the first. After three years of slogging and 10 wells drilled, no oil. Number one produced mostly gas, Number two, more water than oil. Number three, number four, almost dry. Number seven, what a rogue that was. All along, we'd been hoping for the big strike. We were virtually certain oil was there, but now, nothing. On New Year's Eve, 1937, though, number seven, cantankerous as ever, blew out. By 1938, our early hopes had all but vanished. When I arrived,
arrived, there was a cloud hanging over the place. You almost could see it from afar. They had been working for four and a half years diligently and had not discovered any oil in commercial quantities. They had attacked the Damam Dome and anywhere. They drilled it all out of it and had a dry hole. And at the time, the only place left to drill was what later became Abu Hadriya. The first paleontologist had left by the time I got there, signing off on the theme that he would drink all was ever found in Arabia. Uh, amongst the optimists was Max Steinecke, the chief geologist. He had traveled across the peninsula, made careful notes of what he saw, collected innumerable rock samples, and was I of one who later was be acclaimed as the best field geologist in the world. He never had any doubt but that Saudi Arabia would produce oil and in quantities. Half a world away in San Francisco, the boarders was engaged with the question as to whether they would continue or not. One faction was all for continuing ex exploration in Arabia, despite whatever might happen with the, in the deepening of well number seven. The other faction maintained that they had been at the, uh, worked at the concession in Saudi Arabia for four and a half years, and they were simply pouring good money after bad, chucking it down a rat hole in a country half the world away from San Francisco. On the day that oil was discovered in well number seven, I wasn't there. It was uh, during the early morning en route to Bahrain to go back to the United States on my leave. But as I was going down the uh, uh, runway toward the plane, an Arab came round waving a piece of paper and calling Oliger, Oliger. And uh, naturally the first thing I thought was Oligers wanted back over there in Saudi Arabia for some reason. But when I uh, opened my note, it said, we have discovered oil. Bon voyage. Now there would be more wells, more workers pouring into Dahran. And a king would come from Riyadh to see for himself. thought, and I think he did too, that there would just be a small group of Saudi Arabs come with him from Riyadh. We had it, I don't know how many people, nobody does, but it required a city of its own. And it turned out to be just a big picnic for the king and uh, all of the Saudis within. May the 1st, 1939, King Abdelaziz sets off from Dahran for Ras Tanura and the dispatch of the first tanker load of Saudi oil. When we got to Ras Tanura, it was early morning and people were just waiting to see the king appear before. I was one of the lucky fellows to have a chance to shake hands with His Majesty the King. I was very impressed by his size. He was a, a giant of a man. And when His Majesty evolved, he thanked God for blessing us with this wealth. The 
day was really a great event to the people themselves. There were many people followed the king to Rastanura, and with the turning of the valve, knowing, as the king did very well, knew that this meant an income which would permit the king to give his people things that they couldn't afford before. The following day, His Highness, the ruler of Bahrain, came to congratulate King Abdelaziz on the sailing of the first. Thus, the kingdom had entered the stage of world oil.